Cap Roundtree had trapped Beaver all over the country we were riding toward. He had been there with Kit Carson, Uncle Dick Wooten, Jim Bridger, and the Bents. He knew the country like an Indian would know it. Tom Sunday, I often wondered about Tom. He was a Texan, he said, and that was good enough. He knew more about cattle than any of us. Warren and me, well, most of what we'd had all our lives came from our own planting or hunting. We grew up with the knowledge of the herbs a man can eat and how to get along in the forest. The country we were riding toward was, was Indian country. It was a place where the Comanches, Utes, Arapahoes, and the Kiowas raided and fought. And there were Cheyennes about too, and sometimes the Apaches raided right north. In this country, the price for a few lazy minutes might be the death of every man in the party. It was no place for a loafer or one lacking responsibility. Always and forever, we, we were conscious of the sky. City folks almost never look at the sky or the stars, but with us, there was no choice. They were always with us. Tom Sunday was a man who knew a sight of poetry, and riding across the country that way, he'd recite it for us. It was a lonely life, you know. And I expect what Sunday missed most was the reading. Books were rare and treasured things. Hard to come by and often fought over. Newspapers the same. A man couldn't walk down to the corner and buy a paper. Nor did he have a postman to deliver it to him. I've known cowhands to memorize the labels off canned fruit and vegetables for lack of reading. Cap knew that country, knew every creek and every fork. There were no maps except when a man had in his skull, and nobody of whom to ask directions. So Bada remembered what he saw. Cap knew a thousand miles of country like a man might know his kitchen to home. These mornings the air was fresher. There was a faint chill in the air, a sign we were getting higher. We were riding along in the early hours when we saw the wagons. Seven wagons burned and charred. We moved in carefully, rifles up and ready, edged over to them, holding to a shallow dip in the prairie until we were close up. Folks back east have a sight to say about the poor Indian, but they never fought him. He was a fighter by trade, and because he naturally loved it, mercy never entered his head. Mercy is a taught thing. Nobody comes by it natural. Indians growing up thinking the tribe was all there was and anybody else was an enemy. It wasn't a fault, simply that nobody had ever suggested such a thing to him. An enemy was to be killed and then cut up so if you met him in the afterlife he wouldn't have the use of his limbs to attack you again. Some Indians believed a mutilated man would never get into the hereafter. Two of the men in this outfit had been spread-eagled on wagon wheels, shot full of arrows, and scalped. The women lay scattered about, their clothing ripped off, blood all over. One man had got into a buffalo wallow with his woman, and he'd made a stand there. No marks on them. They must have died after the Indians left. No. Cap indicated the track of moccasins near the bodies. They killed themselves with our ammunition gave out. He showed us powder burns on the woman's dress and the man's temple. He killed her and then himself. The man who made the stand there in the wallow had accounted for some Indians. We found spots of blood on the grass that gave reason to believe he'd kill four or five. But Indians always carry their dead away. They aren't mutilated because the man fought well. Indians respect a fighter, and they respect almost nobody else. But sometimes they cut them up too. We buried the two where they lay in the wallow, and the others we buried in a common grave nearby, using a shovel found near one of the wagons. Cap found several letters that hadn't burned and put them in his pocket. Least we can do, he said. The folks back home will want to know. 
Sunday was standing off, sizing up those wagons and looking puzzled. Gap, he said. Come over here a minute. The wagons had been set afire, but some had burned hardly at all before the fire went out. They were charred all over, and the canvas tops were burned, of course. See what you mean, Oren said. Seems to be a mighty thick bottom on that wagon. Too thick, Sunday said. I think there's a false bottom. Using the shovel, he pried a board until we could get enough grip to pull it loose. There was a compartment there, and it was a flat iron box which we broke open. And inside were several sacks of, of gold money and a little silver coming to more than a thousand dollars. There was also a, a few letters in that box. This is, this is better than hunting cows, Sunday said. We've got us a nice piece of money here. Maybe somebody needs that money, Oren suggested. We'd better read those letters and see if we can find the owner. Tom Sunday looked at him, smiling, but something in his smile made a body think he didn't feel like smiling. You aren't serious. The owner's dead. Ma would need that money mighty bad if it had been said to her by Tyrell and me, Oren said, and it could be somebody needs that money right bad. First off, I thought he was joking, but he was dead serious. And the way he looked at it made me back up and take another look at myself. The thing to do was to find who the money rightfully belonged to and send it to them. If we found nobody, then it would be all right to keep it. Cap Roundtree just stood there, stoking that old pipe and studying Orrin with care, like he's seen something mighty interesting. There wasn't five dollars among us now. We had to buy pack animals in our outfit. We had broke ourselves, what with Orrin and me sending a little money to Ma from Abilene. Now we were about to start four or five months of hard work and risk our hair into the bargain for no more than this. These people are dead, Orrin, Tom Sunday said irritably. And if we hadn't found it, years might pass before anybody else did. And by that time, any letter would have fallen to pieces. Standing there, the two of them, I had no idea what was happening to us and that the feelings from that dispute would affect all our lives and for many years. At the time, it seemed like such a little thing. Not in this life will any of us ever find a thousand dollars in gold. Not again. And you suggest we try to find the owner? Whatever we do, we'd better decide somewhere else, I commented. There might be Indians around. <clears throat> Come dusk, we camped in some trees near Arkansas, bringing all the stock in close and watering them well. Nobody did any talking. There was no place to have trouble, but when it came to that, Orrin was my brother, and he was in the right. Now, personally, I'm not sure I'd have thought of it. Mayhap, I would have mentioned it if I didn't think of it. A man never knows about things like that. Roundtree hadn't done anything but listen and smoke that old pipe of his. It was when we were sitting over coffee that Tom brought it up again. We'd, we'd be fools not to keep that money, Oren. How do you know who we'd be sending it to? Maybe some relative who hated him. Certainly nobody needs it more than we do. Oren... He just sat there studying those letters. Those folks had a daughter back home, Orrin said finally, and she's barely 16. She's living with friends until they send for her. And when those friends find out she isn't going to be sent for, and they can expect no more money, then what happens to that girl? The question bothered Tom, and it made him mad. His face got red and set in stubborn lines, and he said, you send your share. I'll take a quarter of it right now. If I hadn't noticed that wagon, the money would never have been found. You're right about that, Tom, Warren said reasonably. But that money just ain't ours. And slowly, Tom Sunday got to his feet. He was mad clear through and pushing for a fight. So I got up too. Kid, he said angrily, you stay out of this. This is between Orrin and me. We're all in this together, capping me as much as Orrin and you. 
we started out to round up wild cattle. And if we started with trouble, there's no way we can win. Oren said, Now if the money belonged to a man, maybe I, I'd never thought of returning it. But with a girl as young as that, no telling what she'll come to. Turned loose on the world at that age. This money could make a lot of difference. Tom was a prideful and stubborn man, ready to take on the two of us. And then Roundtree settled matters. Tom, he said mildly, you're wrong. And what's more, you know it. This here outfit is four-sided and I vote with the Sackett boys. You ain't again democracy, are you, Tom? You know darned well I'm not, and as long as you put it that way, I'll sit down. Only I think we're damned fools. Tom, you're probably right. But that's the kind of damn fool I am, said Oren. When the cows are rounded up, if you don't feel about it, you can have my share of the cows. Tom Sunday just looked at Oren. You damn fool. Next thing you know, you'll be singing hymns in a church. <clears throat> I know a couple, Oren said. You all sit down, and while Tellerrell gets supper, I'll sing you a couple. And that was the end of it. Or we thought it was.